I frequently miss entire days caught in my brain's spider webs. But if I happen to look up in time to notice that the darkness still has a little daylight left to swallow, I will ivy up the fire escape to catch whatever embers of the day are still slow dying behind New Jersey. And last week, through the fog of my loneliness, I realized the living room was slippery pink. Which I knew meant a light show must be on display. So, with a quickness I reserved for emergencies, I scampered to the roof, and sure enough, an explosion of upside-down clementine cotton candy cloud wisps was tie-dyeing the Hudson River neon. And I swear, I am not a lightweight, but I was color drunk immediately, dizzy with gas. And skyward reaching, hoping my fingers might find a bell I could ring that would summon all of New York City to look up and west. But there was no bell and no one to call. Just my own astonishment, still willing to answer after the first ring. How predictable! One good sunset, and I release my nihilism like rose petals behind a bridal gown. Look, I have married my cynicism. And renewed my vows, but it didn't stop the streetlights from coming on at the exact moment I passed beneath them, when nobody else was in the park to see it. Like the whole city was winking, and yes, I blushed the way I do whenever someone beautiful flirts with me. I haven't stopped thinking about death. I am just wringing every last jaw drop from the tissue between heartbreaks. On a long run outside the city, along a highway, and miles from any shoreline, I found a starfish, alone, on the asphalt, an unsolvable mystery, with no witness to corroborate. And there I was again, wandering the streets of Bewilderville, population one. What else could I possibly do but swing wide the doors of my delight to this patron saint of unbelonging, fragile and whole, and so far from home? If you too have been the one nobody asked to dance. I've got a starfish I'd love to introduce you to, and I don't have any proof. But one time, the wind, or my ancestors, or unseasonal warmths, carried three hawks to my kitchen windowsill to rattle my coffin to cocoon, and two of them left, but one of them stayed, eyed me through the glass like a promise or a dare. And so lately. I am trying to pick up when the universe calls. Hey, oh no! <laughs> oh no! Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Sarah Kay. I'm a poet from New York City, and in that very brief dramatic blackout, I also transformed into the co-host of this session. Hey! <laughs> Please give it up for the woman who keeps the ship afloat, Helen. Hi, darling. Let us introduce our first speaker. She's an artist from Amsterdam who believes that with enough trial and error. The physically impossible can indeed be made possible. With her partner Ralph Nauter, who's right here, she founded a, an organization called Drift, which is made up of artists and technologists and engineers and creatives. And together, they create artworks that evoke the mysteries of nature and, at times, border on magic. And she's here to demonstrate just a little bit of it. Please give a huge welcome for Lonica Cordine. When I look at a flower, 
I don't see just a beautiful object to put in a face. I see an intelligent organism that is not still. Perhaps it just opens its petals to discover light for the first time, or maybe it's at the end of its period, desperately blossoming to attract a bee and get pollinated. As humans, we innately respond to the blooming of a flower. But how do we design this exact feeling? How can we capture this visceral response in people? I co-founded an artistic practice to tap the mysteries of this world, not by studying but by making. We called our studio Drift and wondered why almost everything that is made by people is static, because nature is never static. Our mission is informed by nature, and evolution is our process. That means we try and fail, make thousands of iterations before we succeed. In 2006, when the studio was still the two of us, I had an idea. How cool would it be if suddenly little lights would flow down from the ceiling, opening and closing, interacting with us like flowers? I was longing for this feeling to feel present and in the moment, the way how I feel when I walk in a forest. The idea was maybe impractical, because to make movement, we probably had to work with motors and software and other tools and knowledge that we didn't have. So we decided to start this project. In two weeks of kit bashing vacuum cleaner parts and folding paper patterns, we had barely something moving. But it was our deadline, so we brought our drafts to a local exhibition. To our surprise, the shy opening and proudly descending creatures immediately drew attention. People responded to them with wonder and a smile on their face, almost as if there was a puppy in the room. And we thought it was quite cool that with our art, we could change people's behavior. So we decided to explore this further. Project Shylight became a process of years. Coming from art school with no technical background, we had to learn to build control boards, develop programming software, make mechanics move in an organic way with graffiti and complex silk patterns. Basically, we had to become engineers, programmers, seamstresses, and choreographers at the same time. But how do you express a motion between an acceleration factor and a coordinate? Here is where we learned the most important thing. It's not about that it moves. It's about how it moves. Our body responds automatically to certain types of movements, movements we already know from nature, rhythms that are programmed deep within us. We are designed to be in a constant and dynamic interaction with our environment. There are numerous phenomena in nature, that are super inspiring. But perhaps the most intriguing and relevant animal behavior to me is murmuration. Imagine thousands of individuals going places together, with no clear leader, without fighting, still following their impulses and avoiding each other. Isn't this amazing? Because we are not capable of doing this. So dreaming big, we had this other idea. How cool would it be if we could create a memoration with hundreds of lights flying in the sky, responding to each other as birds? Well, you would think you could hang a light under a drone, but back in 2008, drones didn't really exist yet in the way they are today. Universities were testing, in an early stage, quadcopters. And in our search for collaborations and technologies to help get all these objects in the sky at the same time. We didn't feel, find anything. We were just way too early, but we were so excited about this idea. We just had to do this project, not knowing that we would plant a seed for what, almost 10 years later, is becoming an industry. In our software development, I think this was quite a unique process. Different than engineers basing their code on scientific data, we developed our software as artists by observing swarms 
for hours and hours, not calculating but relating to the behavior of these birds. It was incredible how many uncontrollable factors were influencing their choices. But it also made me realize, and it was eye-opening actually, that also this happens to me. I don't have control over my life. With a computer, of course, you can test multiple scenarios in, without big consequences. But of course, this was not the physical reality. Well, imagine how excited we were when, almost 10 years later, this was no longer software. Okay, this is、uh, test one. There they were, drones, one by one, appearing in the sky, slowly starting to swarm. We were observing it. We were feeling it, and we felt nothing. Nothing. <laughs> no emotional response. We remained blanco. What? On the computer, it looked great, but this swarm looked way too technical, and we had to go back and let nature be our teacher, because we were fighting. The nature of our technology. Well, in a creative process, you try, you fail, you start over again, you change direction, like evolution and like murmuration, and you're not in control. But you have to pave the road in this constant and dynamic relationship with whatever that happens. You know when it's right when you feel it. You feel when the connection is made. So in 2018, we finally took our artwork to Burning Man. The drones took off, and it was magic. The swarm, larger than a building, was murmuring over the desert. It wasn't a sculpture or a performance. It was something bigger. It became an environment that impacted the audience all at once in the same way, and together with the music, everyone melted into one energy. People were crying, I was crying. It was powerful, and this experience connected all the present elements in that one moment, and it felt like a collective memory that came from deep within our DNA. In nature, every environment. Thank you. In nature, every environment is constantly moving, and an animal doesn't know what it will eat tonight or at what time. But it will be present in the moment, ready to adapt to whatever is happening. So why are human-built environments static? Nothing moves. Do we realize that this also stops us from moving? Did we unlearn to deal with change? Is this why we stopped noticing our environment? And is this maybe why we don't respond to climate change? And we feel numb while this is actually happening. Behind me, you see a block of concrete. I don't know if you noticed it before, but how do you feel about a block of concrete? Is it necessary to feel anything at all because it's just a block of concrete? We are so used to be part of a static world, with concrete as its main character. But this shouldn't be our world. This is how we used to think, but this cannot be our future. What can we learn if the world is not in our control? What can we learn if we disrupt our expectations? Well, at the moment, the reality is just changing here in front of you. Can you accept what you see? And how does this feel? Is it frightening? Or can you feel a sense of wonder for 
a block of concrete. Can you imagine there would be a moment that you feel open to have a connection with a block of concrete? How can we deal with a changing world? Are we in control? I never felt at home in the static world. And since my childhood, I felt that animal behavior and plant behavior is way more logic than the way how people behave. As artists, we develop artworks that use movement to open us up and make us feel safe to embrace change. Because there is one fact. Change is coming. And we are not in control. We are murmuring. We are drifting. Thank you. It'll be here all session, but just... <laughs> Monica, that was amazing. I'm really sorry, you guys. It's, <laughs> it's on its way out, it's fine. Okay, so come over here. Just as long as we're, as long as we're fine, that's fine. Um, <laughs> we're safe. <laughs> so, um, what's happening? Well... <laughs> This drifter tries to find its way out. <laughs> it's trying to find its way out? Is yes. it sentient? Um, well, it should know where it goes, so let's see. No, but see. really, what's happening? What is going on? <laughs> yes. I mean, this is kind of magic, I would say, and a big piece of engineering for my colleagues and amazing engineers that are making this happen. Yeah. Okay, so with this, you basically just came to the TED stage and told a whole bunch of type A people to cede control, to like give up control. Like, do you have any advice for how we should do that? Especially when there's something concrete floating over our heads. No, but like seriously, like your whole like, your work is about trial and error. It's about experimentation. Yeah. Do you have any tips for the rest of us? I mean, not me, but these guys. <laughs> well, I think um, it's an illusion that we have control. And if you look at nature, you see that it's also not there. And I think we have to um, accept who we are, that we are not in control and that we need to change. We are, you know, our bodies are made to change, but we kind of forgot about it. We build our safety structure around us and we need to learn to go with it and change with it as we are changing and this world is changing. Flanneke, thank you so much. Thank you very much. If you are an architect who is practicing today, you are often faced with the dilemma of how to build sustainably without relying on pollutants like steel and concrete that form the basis for most construction. And what are the other options? So as the founder of the design firm called Wallmakers, our next speaker is on a mission to design and build using new forms of mud and waste-based construction that are enduring, sustainable, and beautiful. Please welcome Vinu Daniel. The construction industry accounts for 30 to 40 percent of the world's total energy and resources. It also accounts for 40 percentage of the world's total carbon emission. A man who lived long before us gave us a very simple solution. And he is Mahatma Gandhi, the father of our nation, India. He said that the ideal house should be built with materials found 
in a five mile radius around the house. So we think, okay, what is that material? And it is right below our feet, it's mud. Now imagine, if we can build a house with mud, there would be nothing more sustainable or eco-friendly than that. But then you might ask, how strong is mud? This compressed 5% cement added mud block made by my alma mater, Oroville Earth Institute, is twice as strong as a country fire brick. In fact, it has a dry compressive strength of 6.5 megapascal as compared to a normal fire brick which just has 3 to 3.5 megapascal. But then you may again ask, what about water? Wouldn't water destroy mud brick? This is a brick from the same institute kept in water since 1995, a little less than 30 years. And you can see that it can still hold a significant amount of load. So what does this tell us? Can we change our perception of construction? Can we imagine a new way of building? Or can we bring beauty to dirt? I demoted myself from being an architecture graduate to being that of a mason. Or maybe I promoted myself, I don't know. I joined hands with local workers and started teaching them mud techniques. Very soon, we started to change every aspect of our construction. Our foundations became poured earth or rammed earth. Our walls became mud blocks or compressed earth bricks. Why, even our roofs became domes and walls made of mud bricks. This is a brick wall residence called Piravet House, which we made in a very crowded community. So it goes in a zigzag pattern in need of natural ventilation. Now, please remember that this wonderful parametric form or curves were made not with any computational technology, AI, or, uh, you know, or robotic arms. These were actually made with coconut twigs, thread, and the mason's bare arms. At a time when the building industry is fast moving towards a future that exists mankind, we brought the value of human resources back into it. But way back in 2012, I was posed with a very life-altering question. I was asked to build a residence, a low-budget, eco-friendly residence for a primary school teacher called Biju Matthew. And when I reached the site, this was what I saw. A mountain of waste and debris dumped by the neighbors after they finished their construction and because there was no other empty plot. So what do I do? Do I stand back and allow this waste to be dumped elsewhere? Or do I reimagine the philosophy of building with materials found in my vicinity? Neither me nor the future generations can unsee the waste that is getting piled in our vicinity. Therefore, we decided to use this waste as a part of our construction technique. We hand pulverized this material, added a bit of soil, and again, 5% cement. And using the techniques we learned so far, we kind of poured it in between two meshes and poured the entire mixture into it. The resultant product was not just a formidable partition. It was load-bearing, means these walls took the load of the entire roof as well. But this came at a price. I was nicknamed Scrap Engineer by locals who found it amusing to see an engineer search through scrap in the junkyard. But what I found in the junkyard was pure gold. 
This is discarded electric meter boxes, washing machine wheels, decaying wood, all became part of a new philosophy that included more and more waste. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Now, emboldened by this, our new aim was to build multi-storied mud and waste construction. Is that possible? Yes. This is Shighara, a three-storied, multi-storied mud and waste construction. We decided to further modify what we did in the Biju Mathur residence. So instead of using two meshes, we put two wooden shutters and poured the same mixture which we did in the earlier project. And the resultant product was as strong as before and economical too. This wall had a dry compressive strength of 4.5 megapascal. And mind you, this building, this residence, we completed in a meager budget of $90,000 as compared to a general budget of $200,000 or more. Very soon, very soon, many practices in the country started adopting this technique, not just because of its eco-friendly part, but also because it was cost-effective. For us Indians, born to traditional societies, very often our dreams culminate in lavish weddings and festivals. This, by the way, is a wedding stage. But the very next day, this too is a common scene. India discards 3.6 million tons of plastic every year. Therefore, we decided to utilize plastic bottles as a part of our construction for a new project called Churi. It's a housing project. And in this project, we started to build circular beams using plastic bottles and reinforced concrete and, of course, mud. We started to build it in circles. To be honest, we didn't know how this would eventually look like, but we still kept on building the circles. We made it stable and put a roof on top of it. You can see how weird this looks. But Churi is a project that resides in a rocky terrain and is populated by a lot of trees and shrubs. Now, generally, these two factors are attributed as very bad things for construction. People generally cut trees or clear them to make spaces for their rooms or buildings or whatever. But in here, the trees not only form shelter, but also cooled the building in a tropical climate. And as far as the terrain was concerned, generally people would fill it up, level it, clear it, and build on top of it. But here, the building is perfectly camouflaged in the rocky terrain that 10 meters away from this project, you will not see it. That is how good it is camouflaged. In this project, we managed to use 4,300 plastic bottles, which would have otherwise ended up as a landfill, or even worse, in the ocean. One day, we all got sick working at the site. We had breathing difficulty, and we kind of went to the doctor. And the doctor very calmly said, ah, it must be the burning tires used in road construction. Stay away. And we were shocked. There are hundreds of kids who travel these roads every day to their schools. There are thousands of families who traverse these roads every day to their jobs. Why some of us even stay on these roads? And the answer is stay away. Upon further investigation, adding to our worst nightmare, we found out that our country discards half a million tires in a day. No, no, I'm not done yet. And the rest of the world discards another half a million tires to India on the same day. Yeah. This is an aerial pic of a tire dump seen from space. This is in a GCC country 
that collects the tires from all of you guys and eventually dumps it in countries like India. Now, you should remember, all of these tires, most of them at least, eventually end up either in the road tarring illegal process or we end up burning it to make again fuel oil because this is a petroleum product. Now, one way to neutralize this huge toxic threat is to use it as part of construction. Now, inspired from uh, architects like Michael Reynolds, an American, we introduce mud and tire to form a new building construction technique. And now, we are building residences, we are building uh, museums, schools, and this is the best way to neutralize this threat and create beautiful construction. We believe that tomorrow, this may also be the alternative for the housing crisis that is a big reality for many of our underdeveloped countries. The heart of every project of ours lies with the problems that we created amongst us. Discarded tires, plastic bottles, construction debris, None of these things should be dumped thoughtlessly or carelessly. The world can not just find a solution, but we can even find beauty in this disaster that we created for ourselves. I remember a single line by a poet of my native language, Ullur, and it goes like this. Namukku name panivadu nagom naragom and it translates to this, it is our choice whether to build heaven or hell on earth. Thank you. Thank you. There are so many strong opinions about how bad the internet has become, how it has weaponized mediocrity, normalized myths and disinformation. But for me, the information superhighway has always been my savior. As a little boy, I was sent from Nigeria to boarding school in the English countryside. It was like Harry Potter without the magic. It was a confusing and troubling time for an already sensitive little boy who was far from home. I was more like an exotic animal in a petting zoo rather than a student. And to top it off, I'm dyslexic, and today what would be described as neurodiverse, which for me meant that the classroom was impossibly slow and my brain was not capable of assimilating how they were teaching me. So, for a big part of my life, I was ashamed of my own mind. And if I'm being honest, I was ashamed of myself. Luckily, the internet had other ideas. Every time I consumed something online, my brain felt alive. It was an awakening of sorts. And luckily for me, I am the right age to have discovered the internet in that very, very moment. So, what did I start doing? I started realizing how my mind worked, how I could assimilate audiovisual experiences into sleep, how I could name a song within the first second of the first note or talk about scenes in films like I lived them, and how overwhelmingly powerful artistic experiences were for me. This became my savior, and I wanted to share it with my friends. So, pop ballads like More Than Words by Extreme, street poetry like Brenda's Baby by Tupac, Films like The Last of the Mohicans, Love Jones, 
and of course, Cinema Paradiso. These experiences were way more than entertainment for me. I was being raised by these experiences, and I needed to share it with as many people as possible. So my friends would come with their hard drives, and I would download and share pictures and poetry and film for them. For me, the internet had become an endless library of the extraordinary. And I didn't just have the keys to this library, I lived there. We would talk about Fela Kuti, Joni Mitchell, Neil Young. These were my heroes. These were the souls that have found the blueprint of how to do and win in this thing called life. It also saved my mental health. The dancing of Misha Baryshnikov was for me like watching a perfect sunset. The voice of Sarah Vaughan was my North Star. And of course, the words of Pablo Neruda, well, that will always be medicine for my soul. So, how did I get to be this great observer of content and become an artist? It was just sharing images. And one of the images I shared all the time was this image of Coretta Scott King. This image was taken by Monida Sleet, Jr., the first black man to win a Pulitzer for photography. This image almost didn't happen because, unbelievably, <laughs> no black media was invited to photograph the funeral of Dr. Martin Luther King. When Coretta Scott realized, she said, no one's coming into this church if Manita Sleet is not allowed. And thank the heavens that he was, because it was his lens that captured the grace and somehow, on an unimaginable day, the strength of Coretta Scott King on the funeral of her husband with her baby girl, Bernice, in her lap. It was this image that taught me that photography can be way more than wedding pics and birthday snaps. It was this image that let me know that at its best, photography can let us know the work that we need to do. So, how did I become an actual photographer? Well, the answer to that is love. My wife, my wife, we fell in love together by feeling each other's invisible scars like Braille. She fell in love with all the parts of myself that I was ashamed of. She looked beyond my anxiety, my imposter syndrome, and she saw a man that maybe had a point of view himself. So she bought me a camera for my 40th birthday, just five years ago. So I have a camera now. I don't know what to do with it. And once again, I go online and I teach myself about ISO and Aperture on YouTube. I teach myself about editing with Adobe Lightroom on YouTube. And there's a great beauty for someone like me to be able to fail and fail in my little office online watching free tutorials. This is a gift of the internet. Everything changed when my daughter was born. You see, the thing about not loving yourself is that when something truly great, something celestial like a child comes into your life, you tell yourself you don't deserve it. My daughter was premature and I was terrified to be the custodian of something so beautifully precious. So I hid behind my camera. And as I kept taking pictures of this little soul, and as she got stronger, the camera and my daughter taught me how to receive love and taught me to accept the immense grace and privilege of being a father. This was the most important moment in my photographic journey. Two years later, in 2020, George Floyd was killed. And all of us 
saw that because of the power of social media. And this time, we refused to look away. I looked to my wife and I said, "I have run out of tears." And she said, "Look to your camera." And I took my camera to the streets of London, not knowing if I would photograph five people or five thousand. And I was able to observe one of the greatest civil rights movements in our lifetime. The global protest after the death of George Floyd is something none of us would have expected, and my lens was there. One morning, I woke up and I couldn't open my phone because I had so many notifications. The son of Coretta Scott King, Martin Luther King III, had somehow come across one of my images and posted it on his Twitter. And then the world discovered me. <laughs> Millions of people saw these images, and now, unbelievably, British Vogue came calling, and they commissioned a then unknown photographer to shoot the September issue of British Vogue 2020. And in doing so, I became the first black man to shoot any cover for British Vogue. It took 104 years to get to my cover. Since then, I've had this extraordinary career photographing amazing humans, amazing moments. But beyond all the glitz and all the glamour, it is really important for me to recognize the intentionality and the empathy of where my lens must look. The world is burning right now, and we cannot pass each other by like ships in the night. So, my lens has to look to where voices need to be lifted. I recently have become an ambassador for Save the Children, and I went to Somaliland to cover the famine, the hunger crisis that is in the Horn of Africa. These brave people. Are suffering because of climate change, of which something, something that they add very little to. Many of the children are born into a hellscape that is not of their making. 1.6 million children are on the verge of acute malnutrition, and I want my images to let you know that you cannot say you did not know. So I ask you to use whatever levers of power that you have. At dinner parties, on your social media, speak to those that can do something about it. If you cannot yourself, I will finish by saying this: Do not be afraid to take the road less traveled. Wear your vulnerability with pride. It is what makes us human. This age of perceived perfection, it's over. Very few of us. Are okay, and that's okay. And to the parents and teachers that are looking after children with different minds, please let them know about the power and possibility of their minds, because they may have the answers that will allow all of us to look toward the horizon together. Thank you.
Our next performer is originally from Chicago by way of Los Angeles. He is a big star. He's got a big voice and big style, which means I'm going to need everybody here to shed their mild-mannered TED audience persona. You can go ahead and just shake that off. I didn't wear this dress for nothing, okay? I need you to just loosen up and get ready to give this amazing performer as much energy as he's going to give to you performing songs from his album, Daddy Land. Please welcome Tolliver. Cool that song, Jake. <laughs> what up, Ted? How y'all feeling tonight? You look good. Call me back, nigga. Glide across the wall. I've been fresh as honey, dude. Since I came up out the wall. Call me back, nigga. Glide across the wall. Yeah, I stay so fresh to death. Have you dancing near your door? Oh! I'm a billionaire. Stashed all in my underwear. Uh, got baby skin. Yeah, just like a cardigan. Uh, I'm interested. And I wear deodorant Don't let me out I'll show late dudes what it's all about Rockin', I'm flaming. Yeah, I won the game Contact me, play tackle, boy Get the hook inside your brain I started to kind of feel like, you know, uh, I got a God in me. Yeah. Something got me feeling like a Klondike. Everybody want to take a big bite. I'm chocolate cold in the center, uh. But lately I've been feeling like a winner. Hey, maybe because the winter done passed. I'm making big moves, people kissing my ass. Been a hot minute since I sat in the class, but I got my hand up. Baby, give me your pass, huh? Ain't no telling. You a freak like me, never feel now. home. Just clap them heels like clap, clap. If you a freak like me, never feel now. home. Just clap them heels like clap, clap. Uh, maybe I'm the Wizard of Oz. I took a lot to blows, every one of them odd. But every day that passes got me liking my odds. I'm not a better man, but I feel like a god. Cause I'm nervous I got a God in me So helpless Snap your fingers and I disappear It just sing like It just sing like It just sing like Hey, hey, hey I'm nervous I got a God in me The heavenly angels sing like Gabriel I'ma make his just as long as 
Jesus and Mabel. Said they make a move from the grave to the cradle. Food feeding y'all, use my lungs as a ladle. I've been having fun with my labels. Pants, sex, prints, eating buns off the table. Soon you see me grinning, no cable. I'm sweeter than a man named Mabel. Uh, Cause I'm nervous. I got a God in me. So helpless. Snap your fingers and I disappear. You just sing like. Thank you, thank you so much, Ted. We appreciate your time. And why don't we just say one more time, I got a God in me. You ready? Two, three, four. I got a God in me. Y'all sing that with us, okay? Uh, uh, uh. I got a God in me. Do you feel it, Ted? Come on, I need to hear you. I got a God in me. That's right. Each and every one of you, baby. I got a God in me. I got a God in me. By the way, in case you were wondering, this is what happens if you put Sarah Kay in outer space into an AI generator. Um, our next speaker made history as the first Latina cast member of Saturday Night Live, where she just completed a six-year run. She has voiced characters for animated films like Toy Story and Wreck-It Ralph, and appeared in comedies on Netflix and HBO. She is well known for her incredible impressions and voices but the voice that we are the least familiar with is her most powerful voice of all. Please welcome Melissa Villasenor. Hey everyone, I'm Melissa Villasenor and I do voice impressions. For example, this is Kristen Wiig about to go skydiving. I changed my mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared I'll get stuck on a cloud and then I'll have to become an angel. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> this is Sandra Bullock if she were to knock over a bunch of dominoes. Just pretend they're here in the room. No, 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 no. That's it. Uh, she always does that in movies. And this is Lady Gaga if she gave birth to a baby and a star is born. Oh, 
Miss Gaga, a star is born. <laughs> and this is Melissa Villasenor giving a TED Talk. Hi, I'm Melissa Villasenor, and I do voice impressions. <laughs> a little bit about me, born and raised in Los Angeles, California, to a Mexican-American family. Uh, middle child, okay, I was very shy, didn't do the best in school, but I was very observant, maybe a little creepy. And I realized I had this superpower of doing voice impressions when I was 12 years old. And it all began with the pop singers at that time, okay? Britney Spears. All you people look at me like I'm a little girl. I know, it's spooky. <laughs> and hot. I should do that all the time, huh? I sang a lot of Shakira back then, just, there's a she wolf in the closet. And I was kind of wolf-like singing that at 13. You know, hairy puberty days. <laughs> I looked up to Gwen Stefani in high school. I loved Gwen Stefani from No Doubt. And I wanted to look like her, so I shaved my eyebrows real thin to copy her like in the Return of Saturn days, that, that Gwen. And I thought, oh, my friends at school must think I look just like Gwen Stefani. I probably looked more like It the Clown. It was spooky thin, just, I kind of always knew I'd end up looking like it. I loved making my friends laugh at school with my voices. And I suddenly wasn't so shy anymore. I felt like, oh, this is why I'm here. This is my purpose, to bring joy and laughs. And I suddenly got obsessed with Saturday Night Live at 15 years old, and I was so determined. I was like, I'm going to become a comedian, and I'm going to get on the cast of Saturday Night Live. So right after high school, I graduate. I go straight to signing up for open mic shows in Hollywood. My parents went straight to worrying for their daughter. Now, I went to junior college for them, you know? I went for like a quarter or a semester. I don't know, I wasn't there long enough to find out. <laughs> But thankfully, I got amazing opportunities pretty early on in my career because I think it was rare to see a female voice impressionist at comedy clubs, and a cute one. <laughs> But I got the opportunity to be on America's Got Talent, season six, in 2011. Not gonna lie, I killed it, okay? 90 seconds? I did a bunch of impressions, just Barbara Walters. I did uh, Natalie Portman from The Black Swan. I did uh, Sarah Silverman. <laughs> Wanda Sykes. Uh, I did Molly Cyrus and Christina Aguilera. From that exposure of being on that show, I was able to quit my part-time job and become a headlining comedian around the country for clubs and colleges. Now, that's amazing if you've been doing stand-up for a while, but I only had 10 minutes, and suddenly I had to do an hour at comedy clubs. So I bombed a lot. I cried in a lot of hotels around the country. <laughs> but I noticed something as I was on the road, working on jokes and performing. I noticed that everyone was laughing at all the impression bits, But every time I tried to talk about myself, my life, my family, they didn't get laughs. It was starting to bug me. People would come up to me after shows and they would go, oh, I love your Owen Wilson impression. He's so funny. And I'd say, thanks. But inside, I'd be like, wait, do they only like me for my Owen Wilson impression? Yeah. That really bums me out. Yeah. So at that point, I became determined again. I was like, no, I'm going to write about myself. I want to find my own voice among the voices that I do. Because I think it's important and it's special, and I think it's the best feeling to connect as your true self with other people. <laughs> and, you know, thankfully, I did find a voice. Yeah, a funny-sounding one, but a voice. And I like making fun of things in life. It just makes life a little easier to handle. I like making fun of my energy. It's not sexy. You feel it. <laughs> My energy is a lot like a proud dad's. <laughs> no wonder relationships don't work out, because every time I go on a date, I check out the dude first thing, and I go, man, look at you. <laughs> hey, you look good. Is that a new jacket? You look really sharp, my boy. <laughs> Here's 20 bucks. Don't tell your mom. Go ahead. I like talking about how I'm Mexican, you know? And I don't look it. A lot of people don't believe me. All my life, people would say, oh, you're Mexican? You don't look Mexican. And I get so apologetic. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot my sombrero. Oh, man. Man, 
did I not roll my R's enough? Sorry, and I just have to salsa away. I know exterior, you wouldn't believe it, but just know that inside, a lot of piñatas in here. I bleed tapatio. You know, I'm, I, I don't speak Spanish. I, I was a lazy kid, second-generation Mexican. I didn't work on it. I know, shame on me. Or as you would say in Spanish, I don't know. <laughs> I have been working on my Spanish, though, because there's a lot of relatives of mine that only speak in Spanish. And I think back when I would hang out with my great-grandma, my abuelita, you know, I would just nod and smile and wave at her. How rude. But she didn't mind, she was just staring at me lovingly, you know. I'd be like, hey, abuelita, how are you? Ay, mira, Melissa, mira. Ay, chiquita, bonita, mira. Mira, ay. <laughs> Thanks, you're bonita too. Ay. And then she'd start talking crap about me in Spanish. Ay, Melissa, ay, si, sí, mira. Ay, está loca, mira. Ay. <laughs> I know I'm loca, you too, huh? No, me no. <laughs> okay. I'm Elisa. Ay. Ay, pobrecita. Ay, pobrecita. What? The tone changed. What are you two saying over here? I don't like this. Why are you sad now? Ay. No tienes novio, pobrecita. What is that? Boyfriend? I don't want one right now. I'm free. <laughs> Estupida gringa, no hablas español. <laughs> Fair enough. See, I like imitating my family and talking about them because that'll never get old. That's always a part of me. Celebrities, I don't even know them, you know, but this means so much to me. I like imitating my mom. She's a funny character. When I'm driving my car and she's in the passenger seat, She's a backseat driver. She comments on my driving, and she knows it pisses me off. So she whispers everything about my driving, which is like, that's worse. Everything sounds so dirty to my innocent ears. I'm driving, she's in the passenger seat holding onto that rail, you know? She's pressing it. I didn't know there was a brake pedal on that side, because she is pressing it. She's just, oh, slow down. Ah, oh, you're going too fast. Ah, oh, we're not in a rush. Ah, oh, oh, my back. Oh, there's a spot. Right there, right there, right there, right there. Ah, oh. you missed it. Ew, nasty. <laughs> now, after nine years in my journey, I did get the, the chance to audition for Saturday Night Live in 2016, and I get cast on the show. <laughs> yeah. It was... So beautiful to be on the show and magical. It felt like I entered, I mean, my dream, it was real. It was, it was, it was beautiful. And it amplified, being on SNL amplified everything I ever wanted, especially for doing voices. Now, I left SNL after six seasons on the show just recently because one, I, I wasn't strong enough anymore to handle the pressure of the show. Two, I wasn't having fun anymore looking up celebrities. And three, there was something inside me, inside my list, that was saying, there's more to discover about myself. There's more talents, there's more things to learn, to expand on. So now I'm in a funny position, because I did the goal. <laughs> Evil laugh. <laughs> No, but it is a funny position I'm in because that was the goal I've worked for at since 15. And it's so like, now like, what do I do? Has anyone here reached a life goal and still have years left? <laughs> it's... <laughs> there, was even, there was one day recently I Googled, what the hell do Olympians do after they go to the Olympics? Just because I want to know other people that feel this way. I did find out on Google, Olympians become teachers and mentors. And I thought... Well, if that, I don't want to do that. <laughs> the thing I noticed within the, the six years of being on SNL, there was something, the best stuff that I did were pieces where I was, was doing my impressions, but I was also very much being Melissa. So as I go forth in my journey, I got to remember to always share the gifts that I have of doing voices and also make sure I could be vulnerable and be myself. So something I love to share in my stand-up shows is 
how I struggle with low self-esteem, and I constantly have to tell myself positive talk and affirmations. Now, I don't use my voice. No, I sound too sarcastic. I don't believe me. <laughs> If I say, I'm good at what I do, I'm funny, I don't know. Thankfully, I have a Dolly Parton impression. <laughs> so I say my affirmations as Dolly works way better. Just, I'm good at what I do. I work hard. I work hard. I work nine to five. What a way to make a living more like 10 minutes, cause I'm doing a TikTok. <laughs> so I hope the lesson or thing you leave with is that I hope you could put your masks down, your personas, and be your true, true self, because man, it rocks. Maybe learn a Dolly impression. So you could look in the mirror and say, I am brave, I am beautiful. <laughs> Or better yet, learn your Melissa impression so you could look in the mirror and say, man, look at you. <laughs> man, you're cool. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bjarke Ingels. Uh, a few years ago, I spoke at TED uh, about the power of design to give form to the future we would like to live in. And our next speaker shares the same philosophy. Uh, he's been spending decades designing technology that fits with the way we want to exist in the world. Uh, and uh, lately, with his wife, Bethany, they have been creating a, a company looking at weaving the power of artificial intelligence into our very lives. And personally, I am very excited about a future designed to put the human experience first. So please welcome to the stage, Imran Shatri. Good evening. I spent 22 incredible years at Apple, helping to design experiences and devices ranging from the Mac to the iPhone and to the Apple Watch. And as the power of compute increased, the size of our computers or our devices decreased. The desktop paved the way for extraordinary interconnectedness, but it was stuck to your desk. The laptop provided portability, but you still had to be sitting down to use it. And the smartphone evolved us into the modern, connected humans we are, providing millions the ability to access the internet from our pockets. And the smartwatch was a window to that phone, a companion device with uh, a whole host of health insights, all shrunk down to your wrist. But what comes next? Some believe AR, VR glasses like these are the answer, but they merely move the screens we already have in our lives today to being just millimeters away from our eyeballs, a further barrier between you and the world. And the future is not on your face. In fact, in 2017, the legendary tech journalist Walt Mossberg wrote in his final column that he felt that soon, one day, technology would become invisible and that the computer would disappear. And we agree. Sorry, this is my wife. I'm going to have to get this. Hello? Hey, babe. Hey, Bethany. How's it going? Yeah, I'm on the red circle right now, actually. Oh, great. Good luck, and don't forget to mention me. <laughs> <laughs> I won't, babe. Thank you. Love you. <laughs> Love you, too. Bye. Bye. It's going to get different in a minute. Um, so my wife, Bethany, and our entire company at Humane have been working to answer the question of what comes next. And you may ask yourself, why? Why would anybody do this? 
Um, it's because we love building technology that genuinely makes people's lives better. And we believed that artificial intelligence or AI would be the driving force behind the next leap in device design. And there is an incredible amount of stuff that's happening in this space. Huge, huge advancements.、Um, and even Bill Gates has said of OpenAI's GPT that、um, it's only the second most revolutionary technology demonstration that he's seen in his entire lifetime. But what do we do with all these incredible developments? And how do we actually harness these to genuinely make our life better? If we get this right, AI will unlock a world of possibility for all of us. And today, I want to share with you what we think is a solution to that end. And it's the first time we're doing so openly. It's a new kind of wearable device. That end platform that's built entirely from the ground up for artificial intelligence, and it's completely standalone. You don't need a smartphone or any other device to pair with it. In fact, I'm wearing one right now, and it interacts with the world the way you interact with the world, hearing what you hear, seeing what you see, while being privacy first and safe. And completely fading into the background of your life. We like to say that the experience is screenless, seamless, and sensing, allowing you to access the power of compute while remaining present in your surroundings, fixing a balance that's felt out of place for some time now. And I can't wait to share more details about what we've built. And I will in the next few months. But today, I want to talk to you about what it unlocks, and what it means to be able to take AI with you everywhere, and what happens when technology increasingly disappears. Technology becoming invisible affords us new opportunities of how we interact with compute. We've become so accustomed to tapping on an app or moving a cursor with a mouse. That it feels second nature, but that's by design. When I was working on the iPhone, I used to test interactions like slide to unlock with my infant daughter. She was the best possible focus group.、Uh, she's 16 now, and she's got a lot more ideas than she did back then. This also, by the way, is the only non-AI-generated image that you'll see from me today. And as I look at it now. I see more than ever why a future driven by AI is far better than a future that would involve more screens, like this. He's cute, though. But for the human-technology relationship to actually evolve beyond screens, we need something radically different. Let me show you. Where can I find a gift for my wife before I have to leave tomorrow? Vancouver's Granville Island is a lively shopping district. That's an incredibly simple response for a very complex query. How often do we find ourselves in a new city, wrestling with our phones, trying not to bump into people, trying to figure out where we're going and where we're supposed to be? It's even harder when we don't speak the language, right? Let me show you something. Invisible devices should feel so natural to use that you almost forget about their existence. Des appareils invisibles devraient sembler si naturels à utiliser. Vous oubliez presque leur existence. You'll note that's me and my voice speaking fluent French. Using an AI speech model that's part of my own AI. This is not a deep fake. In fact, it's deeply profound. This is my AI giving me the ability to speak any language, and you, having a chance to hear me speak that language, in my own emotion and my own voice. Thank you.
This is moving away from the experiments that make us all concerned about the direction compute is going in, but it's instead using technology to create real, responsible compute products that are in service to us and built on trust. This is good AI in action, and we spent thousands of hours reimagining and redesigning new types of compute interactions, ranging from complex voice commands to、uh, intricate hand gestures, all in service of trying to find more natural ways to interact with compute. Why fumble for your phone when you can just hold an object and ask questions about it? The result almost feels like. The entire world becomes your operating system, and when compute disappears, it allows us to get back to what really matters—a new ability to be present, like riding a bicycle in the park and just ripping through emails, or going to a concert without having to hold up your phone to capture it. Or experiencing your toddler's first steps without a screen between you and your child. In the future, technology will be both ambient and contextual, and this means harnessing AI to really understand you and your surroundings, in order to achieve the best results. Imagine this: you've been in meetings all day, and You just want a summary of what you've missed. Catch me up. Patrick is coming to tomorrow's design meeting. Bethany wants to move next week's dinner, and Oliver is asking about soccer this weekend. These are emails, calendar invites, and messages, all surfaced up to the top. You can use these to help guide your decision making, manage your workload, and sculpt tailored responses in your own voice. And in the context of your life, and we gain this context through machine learning. The more you use our device powered by AI, the more we can help you in all times of need. Your AI effectively becomes an ever-evolving, personalized form of memory, and we think that's amazing. In fact, let's say you're health-conscious, or you have certain types of food considerations. Let me just show you. Picked up one of these chocolates.、I、used to eat a ton of these when I was a kid. Can I eat this? A Milky Bar contains cocoa butter. Given your intolerance, you may want to avoid it. So I can't eat these anymore.、Um, but what's cool is my AI knows what's best for me. But I'm in total control. I'm going to eat it anyway. Enjoy it. <laughs> Your AI figures out exactly what you need. And I, by the way, I love that there's no judgment. I think it's amazing to be able to live freely.、Um, Your AI figures out what you need at the speed of thought. A sense that will ever be evolving as technology improves too. And these examples are just the start. As AI advances, we will see how it will transform nearly every aspect of our lives in ways that will seem unimaginable right now. In fact,、uh, Sam Altman from OpenAI feels the way we do, and that、um, AI is grossly underestimated. And I'll add. So long as we get it right, we really believe that we're only beginning to scratch the surface of what's possible. Embed advancements of AI, like、um, uh, in, our, in our device that's actually built to disappear and allow experiences to come forward, and we open up entirely new possible ways of how you interact with technology, and how you interact with the world around you. More humane, intuitive interactions. That are screenless, seamless, and sensing. This is so much more than devices just getting smaller or more powerful. This is the possibility 
of reimagining the human technology relationship as we know it. And that's what's so exciting. It's a huge challenge, no doubt, but it's the world that we want to live in. One where technology not only helps you get back into the world, but enhances our ability to do so. It's within reach, and you saw some of it today. The future will not be held in your hand, and it won't be on your face either. The future of technology might almost be invisible. Thank you. Thank you, Imran. So our next speaker calls himself a mad scientist, and it is safe to say that his projects are pretty out there. He is a creative, immersive experience designer, and he delightedly blends physical and digital worlds into one to make fun, often slightly ridiculous tech projects and experiences that give us a glimpse into what the future might look like. Here to share more, please welcome Lucas Rosato. So a couple of years ago, I went through a pretty brutal breakup, and to keep myself distracted, I decided to set myself a ridiculous art challenge to create the closest thing to a real-life time machine with very little technical experience in the bank account of a college graduate. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but avoiding your feelings is a very powerful force, and I had a plan. You see, all I had to do was to spend an entire year wearing 3D cameras on my face, record my life in first person for 365 days, transfer that into a series of hard drives, and then build a virtual reality simulation that would let me experience those memories in 3D. That's all I had to do. <laughs> in other words, I was going to create a personal time machine, a virtual reality invention that would let me go back in time and experience moments from my past. And building this was pretty insane. I had to learn a lot of technical skills in a really short span of time, and for an entire year, my Tinder profile looked like this. But in the end, it was all worth it because the final result was so much cooler than I could have ever imagined. So this is how it works: you put on a VR headset, you select a date and time you'd like to go back to, you pull a lever, and then, bam! I got to see exactly what I saw at that given point in time. And in this case, I was eating a bagel on a tree, which was a thing that I used to do. And now I could go back in time and re-experience a past trip, try a meal again for the first time, and even hang out with a friend who's no longer with us. And the longer I spent You know, with this time machine, the more I realized that I had accidentally built something that was much more meaningful than I initially imagined, because this wasn't just an entirely new way for you to experience your memories. This was an entirely new way for you to understand yourself. As I used the time machine, I started to become hyper aware of how much of our lives we forget over the years, and how important it is for us to enjoy the moments we have before our minds inevitably forget them. I learned to be kinder to myself, as watching myself wander through life in third person kind of taught me how much of a dick I am to myself when things get rough. And I even started to have an active friendship with myself, as in many of my recordings, you'll find me talking to future me, sending thoughts, hopes, and feelings across time. And this was really cool, and it was also really confusing. Because I was just trying to get over my ex with some art, but somehow, by mixing art and technology, we ended up in a really interesting place. And the world agreed. The time machine went super viral. 50 million people saw it, and it even inspired people to start entire companies based off this concept. So it seemed that by mixing art and tech, I created something innovative by accident. And because that made me feel pretty good, I was like, "Can we do that again?" Could I just take emerging technology, you know, the stuff that's weird, the stuff that we don't understand, do some art, and just accidentally innovate? And so our journey begins. A couple months go by, and ladies and gentlemen, I was back in the game. I had a new girlfriend. Her name was Max, and things were going well. And Valentine's Day was just around the corner. So, me being me, I decided to gift her a little bit of an art project. So, we're about to see is what I can see from my perspective. I'm wearing an AR headset that's tracking her body in real time. So, here we go. 
So love is a really abstract feeling. It's something we all feel, but we can't see or hear. So I created this experience that turned the touch between two lovers into this visual and auditory symphony, basically transforming intimacy into visuals and sounds, which I thought was pretty cool. And Max got to play me too, which I think she liked. But when I posted this online, people started telling me that I had built something completely different, and that is when I realized that by engaging in this artistic exploration of intimacy, I created a new kind of musical instrument—a particle synthesizer that lets you play complex sounds in midair like this. Pretty cool, right? Wait, well, we're not done. Just for good measure, I took those instruments and I attached them to a piece of clothing, so I could now play my own clothes with my hand in midair, which is ridiculous. And I think it's the first example of interactive digital musical fashion. So, for better or for worse, art took us to some really interesting ideas. And at this point, I thought I was onto something, but then I had another、uh, breakup. So, but it's okay. Because an artist can do what an artist does best, which is to turn heartbreak into art. So, jokes aside, this was actually a really difficult time in my life because not only I was going through all of that emotional turmoil, I was also moving to an entirely new country. I was leaving my hometown from Brazil and moving to, into the United States, thousands of miles away from family, no friends, didn't know anybody. So, it was probably the loneliest I've been my, my entire life. So, why not use this opportunity to take my misery and make something cool? What if we use VR to create an experience that's specifically designed to foster the connection that I needed, to make me feel closer to strangers? And that was the genesis of where thoughts go. So this is how it works: you enter these virtual worlds in which you're surrounded by these sleeping creatures. Each one of them is a voice message left by another user who was there before you were. If you raise your fingers and touch them gently, you can listen to the voice messages that people have left behind. And in each one of these worlds, you're asked a different personal question. So by playing this experience, you're essentially going down an intimacy funnel in which you're getting to learn about deeply intimate aspects of other people's lives. And of course, at the end of each one of these worlds, you can put your hands together, give birth to your own little creature, speak into it, and leave your messages behind for others to find. It was sweet, beautiful, anonymous, and people would say things in this experience that they wouldn't share with their closest friends. And when I was making this, everyone told me it was a horrible idea.、Uh, people would tell me that trolls would destroy the entire app, that people would be mean to each other, that people would make each other cry. And you know what? They weren't wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. So when I started testing Where Thoughts Go with the first couple of hundred users, I found out that roughly 20% of them were crying at least once per session. This is what I like to call Where Thoughts Go's cry rate. But people weren't crying because they were being bullied. People were crying because they were feeling emotionally moved by the messages of others. We had created a system that instilled a deep sense of empathy and connection in a really short span of time. And by making this, not only I was able to get the connection that I was craving, but I was able to give it to others as well. And because how this experience was designed, there were virtually zero trolls in the system. It's like people were walking into a church and instinctively knew to lower their voices, treat each other respectfully, and treat the space they were in as sacred, which is a cool thing you can only do in VR. And when I, you know, when I put things that way, it's clear that there's something interesting here, some innovative ideas that could be used, you know, designs and lessons and approach that could be applied. Towards the entire internet, but at this point you might go like Lucas, you're not really innovating anymore. There's a lot of thought behind this, and yes, but no, because a year after I launched this, medical doctors contacted me and tell, told me I invented a new form of group therapy, and now this art piece is being used in a medical trial as an anxiety treatment tool. And shortly after that, I got to collaborate with SpaceX and St. Jude's to make a version of this that astronauts could use, so they could emotionally connect with kids on Earth. This is not what I was trying. To do. <laughs> But that's when it started to make sense, and it's really simple. When you take technology that we don't understand and you approach it as an artist, you do things that the conventional engineer would never think of doing. And when you do that in a space brimming with possibility like emerging tech, it's only a matter of time before you stumble upon something of value. That is why mixing art and tech is a great way to accidentally innovate. It takes you off the beaten path. It removes creative constraints, and it allows you to approach technology in a way that's unique to you, that leverages your passions and your interests, and 
your life events and breakups, and all of this just comes together and gives you a unique angle of approach. And that unique angle is everything. Because here's the thing about emerging technology, and this applies to everything: VR, AI, brain computers, and whatever's next. No one knows what they're doing. Everyone is just following blind hunches. It's too early in a technology's life cycle for anyone to have a comprehensive view of what it's good for. And in a world where no one knows what they're doing, just following your gut is a really great thing to do. Because what we have here is unlimited creative potential. It's the ability to create impossible objects out of thin air at no carbon costs. It's the ability to connect people in ways never possible before, and it's the ability to create technology that changes how we look at ourselves and the world around us. We have all the tools we need to create a future that's beautiful and human and exciting. And the only thing that threatens this is if we, is if we have a massive lapse of imagination. So today, I'm working on a new project called Pillow, and I'm trying to turn your bed, the most comfortable place in your home, into a mixed reality playground of wellness, play, and human connection. And this is an early prototype, but. Look how beautiful this is. We're using mixed reality to connect two beds together and give people a way to engage that's never been possible before. And even though this is early, there's so much that we're learning about how to create meaningful connections between people in virtual environments,、um, how to use artificial intelligence to create immersive experiences that really feel personal, and how to approach products with accessibility in mind from the get-go. Things that work just as well lying down on a couch as they do on a hospital bed. And I don't know where this is going to go, but it's going to be somewhere interesting. And when I look at this, I just don't see art. I see research. I see things that could be turned into products and companies. And I want more artists to start tech companies. We need more artists in technology, but we also just need more technologists to think like a little bit like artists, because some of the world's most important ideas you really can't stumble upon them by just trying to chase the highest valuation. Sometimes you only stumble upon them when you approach technology from a place of truth. When you build things just because you need to make them, and you don't know where you're going, but if you follow your gut, you will be rewarded. And I don't know how or when, like with anything else that I told you about today, but you will be rewarded. We will all be rewarded. And being true to yourself is just a really good long-term strategy. Technology gives us the tools, but art shows us the way. It's always been like this. It's hard to find a single futuristic startup that hasn't been deeply inspired by some kind of science fiction material. Engineers have always followed the imaginations of artists, and that's not going to change anytime soon. But what is changing is that technology is becoming easier to use. I didn't know how to do any of this five years ago. Artists don't have to be in the background anymore. We can get our hands dirty and build science nonfiction instead to create projects and companies that challenge the engineer-dominated visions of technology and propose something new, something a little weirder with a little more heart. And I think in the process we can unlock new realities. That not only we're excited to live in, but that we're excited to see our children grow up in. For the longest time in technology, artists imagine so engineers can build. But I think engineers build so artists can imagine. So, if you have a crazy project in your back pocket, something you always wanted to do but never got around to, you should go for it. You will never know where you're going to find on the other side. Thank you. My heart broken. All that happens is I write a bunch of sad poems. What the hell?、Um, yeah, yeah. I'm just overwhelmed. Give it up for Lucas one more time, please. I'm gonna make him a T-shirt that says, "I got my heart broken, and all I got was this life-altering, world-changing art and technological innovation," and it's gonna be just for him.、Um, Okay. As if. Oh, oh, oh. Also, Lucas will be offering demos of the pillow experience at the house party tonight. So look for the light up clouds to try it out. Man, the sentences you end up saying at the TED conference. Yeah, I'm at the large faucet.、Uh, um, I will be near the box game experience, and you look for the light up clouds to try out the pillow experience from Lucas at the house party.、Um, okay. As I know we are approaching 
stimulation overload, simulation overload, um, but we have one more incredible experiential treat before we release you for the evening. Um, our last speaker of the night is the director of the London-based studio Marshmallow Laser Feast, and he works across media to create experiences that bring us into worlds that are far beyond the limit of our human scale and regular experience. This is going to be a hell of a journey, so strap in, let's embark together, navigated expertly by the very luminescent our son Han Ersen. <laughs> I was a mosquito once, carried by the breeze in the Grisdale Forest in the north of England. As I drifted between the trees, surrounded by the chatter of the forest, swirling waves of pink and purple engulfed me. Plumes of carbon dioxide and oxygen as the forest breathed. Mesmerized by the beauty, never before glimpsed by human eyes, and I was in awe. Then I was eaten by a dragonfly. I became a dragonfly and discovered a magical world in which the entire forest unfurled like a film in slow motion, yet faster than your iPhone camera could capture it. Through my dragonfly eyes, I took in my surroundings with a pretty much a full spectrum of light, unlike my human self had ever been able to perceive. These forays into becoming something other than human came about as part of our experiential art piece called In the Eyes of the Animal, which I developed with my creative partners, Barney and Robin, alongside the members of our art collective, Marshmallow Laser Feast. Our aim was to translate the sensory perception of different species, a mosquito, a dragonfly, a frog and an owl, so we can more deeply understand how they see, hear and feel. It was for us a step into Umwelt, a concept coined by the pioneering biologist Jacob von Uxgall to describe the unique sensory world of an organism. Human notion of reality is just one among millions. Each species has its own extraordinary and unknowable experience of reality based on the unique ways their senses translate the world around them. In essence, your and my umwelt fundamentally differs from the umwelt of a mosquito or a dragonfly. Marcel Proust once wrote, the only true voyage of discovery is to behold the universe through the eyes of another. Our voyage of discovery into animal kingdom led us to plant kingdom and eventually to trees, where miracles appear in every level of magnification. All we need to do is to look closely. In 2016, we found ourselves standing in front of a giant sequoia tree in Sequoia National Park in California. These giant trees are portals through which you leave your human self-importance behind and embody something much larger, much stranger, much more than human. All I could think of was, what is it like to be a tree? What is it like to be one of the largest organisms that has ever existed? One that has endured more than 2,500 years. How does it feel to host a vast web of relationships that anchor an entire ecosystem. Now, step with me into this giant. As we peer through the bark, the vascular system of the tree reveals itself. Infinitely complex patterns and relationships connects all forms of life into a tapestry of interdependence. Carbon and water, more than a thousand liters of water, in fact, flow freely through the phloem and xylem tubes, carry it along, we ascend to the canopy among the neon green moss and the lichen-covered branches. We shrink in size and sit upon a pine needle. A photon of light hits the surface. Water turns into oxygen, and the life we know it materializes in front of us. This extraordinary journey of water inspired us to create our multisensory mixed reality installation called Treehugger, with a team of scientists programmers, engineers, LiDAR scanners, and scent makers, we immerse ourselves in the inner workings of a sequoia to render visible what was otherwise invisible to human eyes. Miley Slenson, composer and the musician, recorded human and plant bioelectrical signals to give us a symphony, a soundscape 
composed in collaboration with the flora. In fact, that's what you've been hearing all along. Participants wore a haptic vest to feel these vibrations as if they are on heartbeat, bringing us a step closer, imagining what it is like to be a tree. When we contemplate the relationship between our breeding cells and the breeding planet, we encounter this great question: Where does my body end, and where does the world begin? As you ask yourself this question, I'd like you to pay attention to your breath. Inhale slowly, and exhale. Feel your tree-like lungs filling and emptying with a rhythmic flow of air. Oxygenated blood reaches your heart. Your heart pumps like murmuration of birds, feeding rivers from the center outwards to touch every cell in your body. Under your skin, you realize you are much like a forest ecosystem. In modern industrial societies, we tend to limit our being to our body. Shaped by the confines of your skin, your body is you, and that's where your you ends. Yet, when we trace our outbreath, the boundary between inside and outside, between self and other blurs, the air we breathe transcends boundaries, sustaining life as it flows between all beings. We take anywhere from 17,000 to 30,000 breaths a day. A third of those breaths coming from the forests, and the rest coming from the oceans. This puts us in an intimate relationship with the trees, thousands of times a day. You might think you've never met a giant sequoia before, but in fact, you've been enmeshed and entangled with one every moment you've been alive. In other words, we are as much trees. As trees are us. Our multisensory mixed reality installation, called "We Live in an Ocean of Air," started with this realization. By translating the umwelt of trees for human understanding, it underscores the bond between humans and the wider family of life through respiration. As participants follow their outbreath into a tree, they become one. Now, notice your outbreath again. Carbon dioxide that leaves your body lands on a leaf, opens its pores to drink it in. Carbon travels through the phloem into the branches, down the tree trunk, and even all the way down to the soil. Here, trees are in ancient cooperation with the kingdom of fungi. These fine threads of mycelium, those intelligent root-like fungal networks. That nurture and feed an entire ecosystem. By simply tracing our outbreath, we realize the reciprocity between all major kingdoms of life, pulsing with one harmonious rhythm. This exploration of rich and diverse life that exists beneath the surface of the soil is the next journey we are embarking on. As fungi capture the public imagination through groundbreaking research, we are very much inspired by the works of Susan Smart. Merlin Sheldrake and many others. The Wood Wide Web, which is the working title, will bring us into the primordial relationship between trees, plants, animals, and fungi, and aim to dismantle the myth of human separation from the natural world. As an artist collective, we seek to find emotional resonance in scientific stories, stories that connect us to the more than human world, and coupled with emerging technologies. Deepen our understanding of what is it to be something other than human. Modern science is revealing something indigenous knowledge has always held to be true: that what is outside of us is not separate from us. We need this ancient wisdom more than ever today, and it compels us to use our technology to both honor and enhance our relationship with the web of beings. The ability to perceive the world through the eyes and ears of other beings, through the phloem and xylem of trees, even reconnects us humans to the fantastic and richly diverse network of organisms that make up our shared earth. It gives us a greater appreciation of what is it to be non-human, which in turn lets us more fully grasp what is it to be human too. And it reminds us, with awe, that. We are all but extensions of one another, 
from three to three to you and me. Thank you.